social media is working. <laughs> First thing you hear. That's awesome. Now I gotta look it up. That's how it works. That's exactly what I thought. Like that's yes, true. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, welcome guys. Um, I had Shana come up here because Shana is actually responsible for getting Alan in here. Um, I met Alan at Shana's house. We went down there and had pie. It's pretty awesome. Lots of time. Started chatting, and I love trainings like this because it's you guys, in this case, Shana, sharing people that are beneficial in your life and in your business, saying, I've been using, what, eight years? Five. Five, Five years. years. Um, Alan has been Shana's lender, and so when somebody says, hey, I just got to introduce you to more of our agents, because we're kind of a family here where we share our, our professionals, we share a lot of stuff, but when you bring somebody and says, you know, you got to meet some more of our people because we are kind of all pretty similar, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let Shana kind of introduce him a little bit more, talk about their background. While she does that, I'm going to share the the screen. He's got a PowerPoint, and then when she's done, we'll we'll do it. Awesome, let's do it. Awesome. I wish I would have had a warning because I would have better. Um, <laughs> it's the cold open. Yeah, I would have better explained. Alan to you, but he's going to speak for himself and you'll see why I like him so much, but he's very knowledgeable in the industry, super passionate about what he does. Um, his team is amazing. Uh, start to finish communication is great. Um, I feel like he has my client's best interest at heart, which is important. And yeah, you, I, I wish I could say more. That's but awesome. Thank you. Cuff, but he really is amazing. You get to experience him for yourself now. So awesome. that's so kind. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Dana. Thank you. Okay. So if you'd like to see what my Christmas tree looks like, <laughs> um, that's uh, that's our my Instagram. And if you saw on that, I try and post things on that that are beneficial, not only to our clients, consumers, but specifically that will help my realtor partners, give you information you can share, things that you can bring to your clients. And just help build your credibility with the people you're working with because you don't need to know about mortgages you just need to know people who know about mortgages so put me on the list there's where we at um feel free to jump in there yeah look at that look at that a minute oh yeah just let that just sit there and just kind of gestate for a minute while all my reels get views okay so here is what we're going to do today here's what we're going to do today i brought money it's little money but it's cool money it's twos it's twos Here's what we're going to do with these twos. My goal today is that each of you are going to learn something new that you didn't know before and come up with some idea that you're going to put into effect in the next 30 days that you haven't thought about before, or maybe that you forgot you knew, right? Something you thought, oh, I'm going to do this. Well, now you're going to do it. And when you come up with that idea, I want you to say new idea. And I'm going to come give you this. New idea. Yes. <laughs> so close. After we start the class. Yes. And, and then after... After you have this, you don't spend this until you've implemented your new idea, or better yet, never spend it. Stick it in your wallet. And then every time you see this too, you're going to go, here's that new idea. It's going to remind you, this is the new idea. Does that make sense? Yes. We good? All right. And then I brought hats because, I don't know, you like hats. So we'll, we'll, we'll do some hat participation. Oh, you need another two. I got like a whole family here of two, so we're set. All right. Are we good? Are we ready? Let's jump in. Okay. So I have only downed uh, 44 ounces of caffeine so far today. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking really slow compared to my normal. Shana will know. This is going to be amazing. How do I go? For... What's the magic? Push the button? Side. Side? Oh, probably the magic is start the thing first. No? Oh, oh, hey, look at that. I just randomly waved it around and clicked. Like, Okay, so again, I talked about the circle. One new idea you can use. That's what I'd like you to take away from spending an hour with me. Um, here's our three pieces we're going to cover today. Number one, why do you care? Why are you listening to me? Who am I? I'm going to talk about the three key takeaways I want you to get from this. And then what's your action plan? Are you going to implement? What are you going to do today? So here's who I am. My name is Alan Blood. I'm the president of CFG Home Loans. We're a mortgage brokerage based out of Farmington. We were in Bountiful for 20 years and just finished the remodel of our building in Bountiful and moved or in Farmington and moved there. So if you're ever up in Davis County and you want to stop by and say hi, come and visit. You can log into our Wi-Fi and uh, stop at the Burger King across the street. Actually, I would not recommend <laughs> Burger King in general, not one in specific, but come visit me anyway. It'll be amazing. Uh, I graduated from BYU in economics, and then I went to law school and proceeded to never practice law a day in my life. That doesn't sound fun. No, I, I thought it would be great, right? <laughs> I learned a lot. It was really cool. I learned how to read contracts and interpret stuff and do issue spotting. And all that's really useful now. Um, but what I did is I was in the mortgage business when I was going to school. 
I was at BYU and I continued in that. And I graduated from law school. I thought, I've already got a job. I need a job. I'm going to stay with the job I've got. So I continued. During that 26 years time, I have seen a lot of changes. So just by show of hands, who's been doing this for longer than 10 years? 20 years. Perfect. So we've got some experience here. So those of you with broader experience that have gone through some of these things, please share. Let's make this interactive. I'd like to hear from you. And those of you who don't, same thing. Let's just have an interactive thing we can learn. I would like to learn from you guys as you have some experience you can share. This is what we've gone through. The tech bubble in the 2000 area. 9-11, um, stagnant prices for five years in Salt Lake. The recession, the recovery, COVID, 2022, regulatory changes, changes in how I can pay people, changes in how I get paid. Change, 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 change. 26 years of change. How many times in 26 years do you think I've heard people tell me how the sky is falling? <laughs> A lot. How many times has this guy actually fallen? None. Zero. Zero. And that, if you learn nothing else but this today, that's what you learn. The sky is not falling. It hasn't fallen and it's not going to fall, right? Number one, we are in a great industry and you're in a great market. And 2023 as a realtor can be a fantastic year. This could be a record setting year for everyone in this room because you guys are here and learning. And there's a lot of people with licenses. And a lot of people with family members that are real estate agents, but they're not here, right? And you guys are here and you're learning and you're going to take this information, you're going to put it to work and you're going to be awesome. Um, in that 26 years, I've used all kinds of marketing. We've done mass marketing and billboards and TV and radio and uh, celebrity sponsorships and direct mailing. And now I finally gave in to Instagram, which when you follow, you'll see that there was like a four-year gap there. Like, hi, I don't know if I can dance. And you're going to find one on there if you look deep enough and you'll find it. No, you, you can't. <laughs> really, you can't. And shouldn't, as my daughter told me, shouldn't is more important. But with that, I've seen a lot of different things. We've tried a lot of different ideas. We found things that worked. We found things that don't work. And I love to share that information. And if you want to know what we've done that worked, I'll tell you. It's no secret. If you want to know what I did that was terrible, I'll tell you where I wasted all my money. It's no secret. Um, I like to learn from other people and not waste my money the second time. So hopefully that will help you. Okay, so... There it is. Here's our three takeaways. Number one, we're going to talk about why you need to learn from history. If you don't know the history of our market, you need to figure it out and learn that because it's going to change the way you approach the future. Number two, we're going to talk about making, not chasing the market. And it's very different, right? And then number three, we're going to talk about the value of commitment and why that matters and how that's going to wrap this all up into one nice, pretty Christmas time bow. Is that fair? Okay. Again, you ready? You ready with your new idea? Anybody know Winston Churchill? You've heard of this guy? There's this quote that's attributed to him. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Ironically, he was not the first person to say it. He repeated it from a guy who repeated it from a guy. Kind of fits with the thing. Mark Twain, he's attributed this quote. History does not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. There's no record of ever, ever saying it. But if you Google that, you'll, feel, you'll find it attributed like crazy, right? He just cribbed it off of somebody else at some point and somebody threw his name on it. Does it matter who said a quote? Does it give more power to it? I think we think it does because we can look and say, oh, well, Abraham Lincoln said this, so it must be true. Maybe, but maybe not. I think the truth is in the result. We'll talk about that as well. So just keep this in mind. So what are you hearing and telling yourself about the real estate market right now? What are you hearing? What are you hearing from clients, people, neighbors, friends? What are you hearing? Awesome. I love that. That's a good one. Is that what you're hearing or what you're telling yourself? I love it. Okay. Being a realtor is fun. It's like your jacket because that's fun. <laughs> it's fun, right? What else? Hearing rates are too high. We're going to wait. Definitely hearing that. Yep. Saying otherwise. That's what we're hearing. What are you hearing? Waiting until after the holiday. How many have talked to somebody in the last 30 days, 60 days that's waiting for prices and rates to come down? Is that going to happen together, by the way? Like, those kind of do this thing, and we know that, right? So this constant stream, how many of you read the news? I'm a fairly avid news reader in a variety of places. What's the news story? What's the news telling everybody? The cracking. Doom the, and gloom. Doom and gloom. Why? Why? Which sells? Yes, is which market? Because we're yeah. talking about it as a whole, and there's four markets out there, and we're not talking about anything in the That's it. And if you look at the specific news, the media that's being fed to our clients and fed to ourselves, 
That's it. The market is crashing. It's doom and gloom. It's going to be 2008 all over again. The sky is falling. Run around with your hair set on fire. That's the only way to respond. And it's hard, I think, sometimes to not fall into that mental trap. Because if you believe that, what are you going to be communicating to your clients and to the people you're working with? Maybe it could be. Um, there's agents that I work with that 100% buy into that theory. And that's what they're selling to their clients. Doom and gloom. Market's crashing. And do you know people who are in that boat? You probably do, right? This is not a good way to win, right? This is not a good way to make the market. So the first thing we need to do is we need to really look and say, okay, what's really going on? So these are the two things I'm hearing. This is all new. We've never seen anything like this before. There's no way to predict what's happening. This is all new. Nobody knows what's going on. Or, well, this is just like last time. Been through this before. I can tell you what's coming next. And the truth is probably somewhere in the middle because this is unprecedented. If you go into the next year thinking it's going to be like the last three, it will not work out well for you. Even if you're thinking it's going to be like 2011 or 2002, it's probably not going to work out for you because it's different. We have a very unique set of circumstances that have changed the dynamic of our country. COVID and the money from COVID has completely changed the supply and demand metrics, right? Completely. And it will not be altered. It will not go back. There is no return to where it was. There's just moving forward from here. So when you look at past history and models, you have to keep that in mind that we have had a global economic changing event. Not just the disease, but the financial repercussions of how that was dealt with, with our government and with federal spending has changed. Whether you loved it or not, it doesn't matter. It's changed the dynamic. And you have to keep that in mind when you're thinking, how am I going to go forward? So let's see what we can learn from the last couple of times in this merry-go-round that will help us this time. Is anyone familiar with this? The market's quadrant cycle. This is used extensively in commercial real estate. I don't think it has as much awareness in the residential world. I can't believe I still have all my dollars. This is going to be great. I'm going to yes, I want to hear it. New idea. What is it? Passion. You are aware of the first okay. $2 so bill. So this whole history repeating itself, like we need to learn from history thing. In my head, I just related that to um, us as human beings and how we always kind of put ourselves in this, like, I'm different from everyone else. I'm the only one struggling or going through this. Whereas, like, it's the same concept, right? It's like we're all going through the same thing, and you can learn from those around you. I love it. So that's I love idea. it. <laughs> I love it. We're pulling together. Okay. Yes. This is very valuable. You need to understand this. This is very valuable. You need to understand this. Should I say it three times? Yes. This valuable, you need to understand this. Let's talk about what this is. This quadrant, no new construction, expansion, hypersupply, recession. This repeats again and again and again, and it will repeat again and again. I've been doing this for 26 years. This is my second time around this merry-go-round because this is about an 18-year cycle. Um, notice the date on here, 1995. Keep that in mind when we talk about this because this was well before the housing recession. So let's talk about this. Is. You start in the recovery phase. When was recovery here in Utah after the housing recession? 2011, we started entering into recovery. In 2011, there was an 11.2 month inventory to sales ratio in Utah, meaning there was 11.2 months of real estate on the market for sale as compared to the buyers that were out there. That's not good. What's our inventory sales ratio right now statewide? Anybody know? I see it all the time from the NAR. What's our time on market? Same, it's the same map. What's the average time on market? 46 days. That's the inventory to sales ratio. 46 days. 11.2 months. Are we going to crash? Heaven's sakes, no. Okay, so recovery. We start coming out of this oversupply. There was no new construction. In fact, we'll talk about this. There was virtually no construction for 10 years coming out of the recession. Maybe three years into it and, two year, and, and seven years after. No new construction. So there's no new construction here until you get to a place where you have some equilibrium and suddenly there's enough demand to meet the existing houses or apartments or whatever it is, living units. And then what happens? What do builders start doing? Oh, we, we've met the demand. Now what do we do? Build, 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 build. Start building, ramping up, build, 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 build. Get to a point where there's equilibrium. So we've reached a point where there's as many houses as we need. Are we at that point yet? We are not. We are not. Reach the point where we've got as many houses as we need, and then what happens? Because they're still building. Well, then we fall into oversupply. In other words, they build because they keep building. Oh, now we've built too many houses, apartments, whatever it may be. And now you've got oversupply. So what happens? There's too much supply. You see prices soften. You see time on market lengthen. Does this make sense? 
And then you fall into this place where you get into this really oversupply and you fall into recession, into a housing recession or recession in general. And then what happens? Everything slows down, slows down, but does the population slow down? No. Not in Utah, not anywhere, but not in Utah. So we continue to grow in population, but we're decreasing our demand. Supply isn't happening. And then you hit this level point of 2011 again, and then what happens? Well, start right back over again. Is this new to anybody? It's the first time anybody's seen this, this graphed out like that. Awesome. Read about this. Do some research on this. This will inform you as to what's going to happen in five years and two years and 20 years. Is that useful? Yes. You now have a crystal ball. Please. I love it. How are you going to put that to use? Oh, you know what? Yeah, you guys snag that one. Um, I'm going to share that on my social media after I look at this Christmas tree. <laughs> Thank you, you tag me. And you're following me now. <laughs> you're following me now, so. I am. Now. Actually, I found out you were following me, so you. Look at that. <laughs> Don't you worry. Tag you. It's all right. I got you. Okay. Lots of different theories about how this comes around, but the underlying principle is the same. This is gospel fact. Okay. Let's talk about one of those theories. This guy, Phil Anderson, wrote a book called The Secret Life of Real Estate Banking, and here's my disclaimer. He's a bit of a kook. And he's into numerology. That doesn't mean that what he's saying is any less true. Um, he's, a, he's an economist out of Australia. He's been following this. He wrote this book. You can get it on Amazon for about 45 bucks. Uh, you might check it out. He's gone back and looked at the last 220 years of the real estate world, and guess what he found? 11 cycles of the same thing. Does that make sense? Here's the conclusion. Inflation always leads to property price growth. Inflation eventually goes to property always. Does that sound fake to you? Anybody have a thought on that? Are we, in, are we in an inflationary market right now? What is that going to lead to? Always, inflation will lead to property price growth, at least for the last 220 years. Is 2023 gonna be the exception to a 220 year cycle? Has there been economic global disruption in the last 220 years? You bet. Has there been technological changes that have changed the market forever? Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, we're kind of the same, right? But other than, you know, like the iPhone is the one thing, but everything else. Okay, inflation, inflation leads to property growth. How valuable is that information to know? Very, because we are in inflation. What is going to happen? So here's your proof. 1979 was one of the highest inflation periods on record. What happened in real estate in Utah that year? Anybody know? 21% increase in the average prices. 21% increase. Guess where interest rates were in 1979? 18%. Inflation rate, 12%. Home prices, 21%. It was the highest price increase in record in Utah, eclipsed by last year. Okay, so we're not done with this yet. So according to this model here, we are right here. We're in the midterm slowdown. This is 2011. This is 2018. Take COVID out of this. And this is what we would have seen. Put COVID in and what we did is we shifted some of this demand over here. We just pulled a little bit over here, but we're in the midterm slowdown. Yes, please. Am I giving you $2? Yeah, yeah I love it. What am I giving you two bucks for? Um, idea that now is the time to buy because so you want to get in now, not wait for the price cuts. You can renegotiate your interest rate there. I hate this phrase just because I don't know why the, the marry the house, date the rate, but it's true, right? So your idea was now's the time to buy, get in the house, commit that. It's true. It's true. It's trite, but it's true. Because you are right here. This is where we are. We're right here. And what's coming next? Probably some of this. Probably some of that. Um, okay, so does this mesh with your experience? Anybody who's been doing this for a while? Anybody have a different experience than this you want to share? This meshes with my experience. Okay, let's keep going on. Let's talk about how this applies in Utah. This graph is turned on its side. So this is the percentage of price growth each year in Utah going back to 1977. Okay, you see a cycle? There's 45 years there. Nine of those years, we had a price decrease in real estate. So roughly 20% of the time in Utah, 
home prices did not go up. Well, what's the inverse of that statement? What happened 80% of the time in Utah? Prices went up. This, by the way, comes from the St. Louis Federal Reserve website, which is a wealth of data. And if you would like a link to that, just reach out to me and I'll send it to you. There's a number of sites that I use to, to go and find stuff out. This is a good one. It's got a massive amount of data and it makes nice pre-graphs that you can use, like this one right here. Okay, so this is real estate in Utah. Here's where we are right here. You see a midterm slowdown? Again, COVID amplified this like crazy. So we've got to take that into account, but the model is still the same. Okay, so let's talk about some numbers here in Utah. What are the drivers for real estate? There is really one key one, and it is employment. There's been two housing recessions in Utah ever, ever, where we've seen housing recession, recession defined by price decrease over more than two quarters. Two ever in the history of tracking Utah real estate. Guess what those coincided with? They coincided with unemployment, with job loss. One of them you see right here, little deep, this green chart right here, if you can see it, that's the unemployment rate in Utah. And there was a little bit of a dip down here and we saw prices kind of stable and slow down. The other one you see right here, you see a spike up in unemployment right there and you see home prices drop. This was the recession. If we have strong employment in Utah, we have an increasing real estate market. End of story. 45 years of truth. Yes. Yes. Our population's going, our employment is going. And that's not stopping, guys. We're not stopping. Anybody read about what's happening down? What are they calling it? The point. Um, used to be the prison. And now, now it's the point. Maybe they put an E on the end of it so it's fancy, right? The point. What's happening at the point? How many houses are geared for the point? This was in the news a couple of days ago. 3,000 new residential homes are being built in the point. What's going to happen? What do we have to have to build 3,000 new homes in the point? <laughs> Number one, let's fix Bluffdale first. Maybe a little infrastructure. That'd be crazy. But what else? We need jobs. We need so many jobs. We need every trade. And we need a lot of them. And what are the builders going to have to do to get those trades to show up? Build places for them to live. They're going to have to have Home Depots to buy out. They're going to have to have grocery stores. And they're going to have to pay them more money. Because they're going to need all those people to move from Wisconsin and Idaho and California and Nevada to come build houses here. That's it. The ranches and the uh, Silver Lake and everything that's right next to the other side of the canal from Sarasota Springs is booming right now. Not city centers, but everything else. Everything there. My, my kids love to play the game of if you had a time machine, what would you do? And I'm like, I would go to Saratoga Springs and buy a house in 2008. When you could buy a house at 46 cents of the dollar for new construction. Did you? Yes. Ah, genius. <laughs> See, look how smart you were. You didn't even know then. You were a genius. You're a real estate magnate, man. Doubled in value. Okay, so that's our graph number one. This red line right here is all transaction home prices in Utah. What does that line look to you? It's a very, that's a very nice stable, stable increase. You're going to find in Utah that our real estate goes up by about 4.89% per year, every year on average over any 10 year period of time. That's it. The national average, 3.8%. So what are we doing? Better. We're, we're doing better. We're beating the average. This blue line right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Blue line is how I, I told you wrong. Red line is population. Let me redo. Red line is population. Blue line is home prices. So we see the population is stable. We see home prices taking these dips and turns, but draw a line from here to here. And that's where you get that 4.8%. If you just take the mean of these, not even here to here, from here to here. So this is what we see in Utah. This is the data, these are the numbers, and this is our population, which is not slowing down. Okay, so let's talk about demographics and why demographics are going to help you. 53% um, of home buyers last year were what age? Anybody know? Right here. They're in their early 30s. The millennial age group account for 53% of buyers in the, in the country last year. By the way, have any of you read the, uh, the NAR's annual report? It just came out. This is another one. The NAR's annual report comes out every year about this time. It talks about home buying trends. One of the really valuable things in that is they do a lot of studies and research as to, did you use an agent? If you use an agent, how did you find them? Guess what the number one reason is that people found an agent for a number of years, including this year? They knew them. Close. They knew them. 
they knew them or they're referred by somebody they knew 75% of the time. So we spend all of our time trying to reach out to people and create new people. But what's really the goal? You got to get to know and connect with more people because they're not calling you because they saw your cool tree. They're calling you because they saw your cool tree and then they connect with you and now they know you. And then 75% of the time they call you because now they, they know you or they think they know you. That's the beauty of social media, I guess, right? So here's our, here's our demographic. The largest population also happens to be the buying population. So are those people going to continue to buy? That also happens to be prime working years that are seeing significant increases in their wages right now. Are those people going to buy? Absolutely. So what do you need to do? Who do you need to be talking to? You need to be talking to people who are 28, 34 years old. That's who we want to talk to, 28 to 34 years old. That's our people. Now, this is the other graph here. Um, this is the housing shortages in Utah. This comes from a thing called the Gardner Institute. The University of Utah has this think tank. It's the Gardner, it's the Chem Gardner Institute. It's K-E-M Gardner. And you know the annual uh, report that they do every year in January, the economic data, it comes from this group. They've got a lot of really good information, a lot of really great studies. This is one of them. This came from the report last year. So this is a little data. What this shows is, is construction, um, new housing units as compared to our population. Okay, so this is Utah only. In 2010, there were 15,000 more households created in Utah than there were houses built. That stays as a positive every year, but 2018 was the only year that there were more houses built than there were households created in Utah up to 2020. So the aggregate in 2020 was a 45,000 housing unit deficit in Utah. That's apartments, that's um, duplexes, that's any legal residence. That also, by the way, includes second homes and Airbnbs. How many second homes and Airbnbs do you think there are in the state of Utah? Really hard to get a number on it, but probably around 10,000, okay? That means really this number was 55,000. As you take those Airbnbs and second homes out of the mix, that's not where somebody's living. That's where they're staying for the weekend, right? So we had at the end of 2020, a 50,000 housing unit deficit. So what should prices have done just with that information alone? Absolutely go up, right? Supply and demand. We did not have enough. So go back to our, our thing we started out with. We still haven't hit that equilibrium point yet because we still have a deficit in housing. People are waiting because they think rates are too high or they think that Prices are going to come down. Are they going to wait forever? Historically, no. How long do you think it takes for us to get used to a new idea? What would you think? There's been some studies done on this. 60 days, even less than three months. So close, 60 days. So based on some studies, within 60 days, we assimilate some new ideas. So the new idea that people are trying to assimilate right now is interest rates are 7% or interest rates are 6%. And why have people not assimilated that idea this year? What rates been doing all year long? Iraq, there has not been a 60-day window where we had price stability. What have home prices been doing? Have we had price stability? Let's price this, that. There hasn't been a window of stability. So what is going to happen? What do we need to happen for people to get on board with, this is the market, we're going to buy houses? And how long is that going to take? 60 days. So when should you be in front of people who are waiting? Because what's going to happen in 60 days from now, after the Fed does their announcement today, gonna we're going to have price stability. And it's going to be the spring right? It could be the spring. What are home prices do every year in Utah? Every year, gospel truth, every year, home prices in Utah in the wintertime. Statistically, yes. Go to that same website I saw before and you can find average time on market going back for 45 years. So every year. Yes. This is why can I give you $2? Is this your new idea? This is my idea. This is my idea. Keep going. Keep going. Is this is the time to buy because this is when the prices are low. We don't have yes. any more other choices. But I really feel like after the new year, because uh -huh. so many people are sitting out there like, I'll do it after the new year. I'll do it after the new year, you know? And so if we can show them right now, this is their little window. Like last window, last year, their little window to sell, it was astronomically perfect. Mm -hmm. And so many people waited to spring. Yeah. And that's right when we... We have something. the change. Yeah. That's it right now. Um, if you want to follow me on Instagram, I made a little video about why now is the time to buy. Share it if you want. Or just go watch it and see what my fireplace looks like. Trees in the maybe maybe the trees in the corner, but my dog's in there, so that's good, right? I feel like I may have marked it. Oh, nice. Bumps right here, man. Let's bring it on. Okay, so lots of really good data, lots of resources out there. If you like these resources, please let me know. I'll share them. We should share these all over the place. Um, okay, so let's go back. Learning from history, recap what we just talked about. 
This is not the first or the last time we're going to see this cycle. How many of you are going to be in real estate for the next 20 years? Are you going to see the cycle again? Absolutely, yes. I like Yeah, yeah that's, that's it, right? Once you know and you embrace it, you're like, okay, this is kind of fun. I know what to do here. You're going to see this again. And here's the key thing. There are opportunities in every segment of this cycle. You just have to know which opportunities you're going to go and present to, right? So what's the opportunity right now in this segment of the cycle? I just told you, what is it? There's a great, there's a great uh, way to communicate. Who should we be communicating that with? 28 to 34. Close, but go to 24, right? What's interesting is the last five years have changed our first time home buyer uh, makeup in Utah dramatically. We used to have much younger first time home buyers, but with the changes in the real estate values, that's aged up, right? But we've got a very large population of people who are living with mom and dad, renting, living in the basement, living in the duplex, waiting until spring. Oh, if I could just get any buyer that I'm working with to understand that if you buy before Valentine's Day, you will save money every year. And ask me for my stats. If you've got somebody who's a statistically minded person, I'll send you the chart and you can prove it to them that it's true because it's true. It's just the way it is. Okay. The fundamentals to navigate this are the same as all the other cycles. What are those fundamentals? You got to be a source of information. You got to maintain a connection because who does 75% of people work with? Someone they personally know or refer to. No, I can trust. I feel like I know where you go once a week in the mornings to meetings. To be no, I'm just, I'm just <laughs> but you know, right? No, I can trust. So you've got to know, like, and trust. You've got to maintain this connection. And that's the word. Isn't that a good word? Connect. We have lost connection. I love being here with the group with you guys. I could teach this on Zoom and the Zoom people. Awesome. I'm glad you're joining. But it's just different, isn't it? Yeah. The connection that you get. And that's where you need to be. Connecting, 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 adding value, adding value, connecting. Same skills in every cycle. And then this one right here. We've got to be consistent in our message. If you get on the doom and gloom train, you're done. Shana, do I get to give you two dollars? Me, I love this. I mean, it's exactly what you said, but it's it's literally not riding a roller coaster, being consistent in your social media, showing up every single day. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life. That's it. Show up. Be consistent. And there are some really good tools if you want to be on social media that I've been learning about and using that will help you show up even when you're not showing up. Um, okay, are we good with this? Let's move on. I will. Like good sake. We can save this. I mean, I could stretch this out for another 20 minutes or three hours. How much time do you got? Okay, let's talk about making your market. How many of you have felt at times in your career like you are chasing the market? Absolutely, I have. Okay, what's next? Wait, what's going on? What's happening? Where do I go? This isn't working. Let's do this. This isn't working. Let's do this. I just told you all the marketing fails I've had, right? I had been working actively to fail forward. And I'm just doing a great job of failure, right? Learning as I go, failing forward, which is a great book. Um, chasing the market is an exercise in futility. If you chase the market, which you probably all have, you know. It's mentally exhausting, isn't it? When you're chasing the market, it's stressful. It's nervous. It's anxiety. So let's cure that and start making the market instead of chasing it. So law of attraction. How many of you are familiar with James and I were talking about this beforehand? I thought this was a bunch of garbage. I'll be honest. I, I've heard this for years. And I've known Shana for five years. And she's all about this. And every time she talks, be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, whatever. What a bunch of hocus pocus. Get your Harry Potter wand and make the magic happen. Well, it turns out Shana knew a thing or two. And I've learned a thing or two. So a lot of tracks, the basic tenets of that that I found are this. Like attracts like, right? Does this sound right to you? You want to be around people that are like you? You're a negative, unhappy person. Who are you going to attract? You're an upbeat, happy person. Who are you going to attract? Probably. Nature abhors a vacuum. What does that mean? Nature abhors a vacuum. Bring in what you do like. What if there's empty space in your life? What if there's empty space? What if you're not getting your message out there? What's going to happen? Else Somebody's going to fill it. Something else will. Nature pours a vacuum. So if you're just letting this sort of happen, not being proactive, you're not being intentional about this, the way of the world is entropy, right? Things fall apart left on their own. This is an intentional process. Number three, the present is always perfect. Who feels like their present is perfect? I mean, obviously the past right now, right? Like for sure. <laughs> the present is all, why is your present perfect? 
The present is always perfect. Right now, where you are is exactly where you are, and there's not one thing. Who can change the present? Can you? This is where we're at. It's already predetermined. You can change what you do now to change tomorrow, but you cannot change today. So if we're spending our time thinking, oh, I should have done this. This would have changed the outcome today. Oh, man, I, would, I should have called that person. I should have, I should have followed up. I, I should have done. I, I could have. I would have. We're not living in the present, right? We're living in the past, and we're not changing the future. So the present is always perfect. There's your tennis. Well, it turns out this isn't hocus pocus from Oprah Winfrey, right? And this is what turned me off. James, we're talking about this, the book, right? The movie turned me off completely because I didn't understand. So I started reading and understand. Turns out this is a very, very old concept. In Christianity, it's called the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. In Hinduism, it's called karma. What goes around comes around, right? It's a basic tenet. Sow a seed of virtual action, reap a harvest of pleasure. In Buddhism, it's the Lotus Sutra. It's the basic tenet of Buddhism. The stage of enlightenment. See if this sounds familiar. Sowing, maturing, and harvesting. Is this idea a legitimate idea? Every school of thought, Eastern and Western, in all of history, thinks that this is a legitimate idea. So I'm going to say, yeah, I'm, I'm on board. Jana, I'm on board. It took me a minute, but I'm there. I'm on board. So with this idea in mind, how are you going to make your market? Um, I was talking about coming in and teaching these classes. I've had an opportunity to teach classes in a lot of different offices. The way you guys do it here is amazing. You have a system and a process that I just keep saying this because I was blown away. There was follow-up. There was text. I got a video saying, this is what our room looks like. This is what to expect when you come in. This is how many people are coming. By the way, remember, next Wednesday you're teaching. Next Wednesday you're teaching. Next Wednesday you're teaching. I got a phone call. And it was awesome. It was awesome. I loved it. I knew exactly what to expect when I walked in the door. I'd never been here in my life. I knew what it looked like. I knew what to expect. I knew what the process was going to be. I watched some other trainings that people had done. I knew exactly what was going to happen. And you say the same about your prospects. Do they know exactly what is going to happen after they talk to you? It's hard, but it's necessary. So here, that's awesome. If you've got a process I love. So here's what I would recommend if you don't have this yet. Here's what I would recommend. You need to have a defined process and you need to have a written, in my opinion, a written defined process. And this process is going to be, what is your process when you're prospecting? What do you do to prospect? What do you do? What's your process? How do you do it? What's your process for following up when somebody says, yeah, I'm interested. I'd like to do something with you. You have a written defined process of when someone does this, I will do X and then, and then, and then, right? You have a process for when somebody is in transaction, they've written a contract and they're under contract now. What's your process? How do you communicate with title, with the lender, with the seller, with the seller's agent? What's your process? And then what happens after closing? You have a process for connecting and maintaining that relationship after close. Now, in the world here, we call this a CRM, right? But in reality, this is just being a person and knowing what you're doing and having a plan. This might be a really good place to start if you want to make a mark. What is your process? Have you written down? Have you thought it through? When things go wrong, what's my process? When somebody calls me, what's my process? Because without this, we might have a method. We might have a way of doing things. But do you have a process? Probably not. Without, without all the stuff you guys did to introduce me here, I wouldn't have known what I was doing. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I guess I'll figure it out when I get there. We don't want our clients to feel that way. We want our clients to be like, I know exactly what's going to happen next because then what do they want to do? Oh, yeah, they love you. They want to move forward. Here's another interesting stat from the NAR's report. Um, how many people, percentage-wise, do you think said that they would work with their real estate agent again? I'm going to tell you it's higher than you think. Just under 80%. How many people actually work with the agent again? 20. What happened to the rest? They liked you. They loved you. You did a great job. They didn't even told somebody about you. What happened? You didn't have a process. I bought a house with an agent in Arizona 14 years ago. I get a Christmas ornament from them every year and a, and a, a newsletter in January or in, in June, sorry. Connect with me twice a year. I don't live in Arizona. I'm not going to buy another house in Arizona. It doesn't matter. I know who these people are. And I think, oh, they're really nice people, right? They've got a defined process. What's your process? Does this help? Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Anybody get any new ideas yet? Okay. You got a new idea? Most people, they advertise like what they do for people before and after, but they don't have to. Yes. And so that's one thing I wrote down is you have your process. 
make them feel comfortable with the process before they even start. Love it. We all know what you do. You help people buy houses, right? But how do you do it? Right? How do you do it? And how is that different from everyone else? Because that's where you can differentiate. And that's where you can get this law of attraction going and bring in those people that are just like you. Because how many of you want to work with an unpleasant, unhappy client? It's not awesome, right? We will, right? We'll help. What's that? Because you get a victim? <laughs> so attract people like you. Yes, please. New idea. I love it. We're going to pass this back. I'm not going to walk over there. You might pass this back to the back of the room. I love it. What's your new idea? Better watch out. I think he's going <laughs> to. I'm still waiting for your new idea. It's going to come. It's going to come. What's your idea? I love it. She owes you more than two bucks. Let's be honest. Love it. Genius. Absolutely. Boom. Boom. Love it. Love everything about it. And if they're not going to buy, guess who they know? You know, somebody who is. They're like, man, this property manager, they're like, they're crazy. They're great. They do all these neat things. They communicated with me. Awesome. Let me refer. Okay. What's the difference between adjusting your strategy and chasing the market? Do you need to adjust your strategy? Yes. Yes. We all just went through the last two to three years. You've got to be willing to adapt and adjust. What's the difference between adjusting and chasing the market? Is there one? Proactive versus reactive. I think that's it right there. Looking and saying, were you going to add something different? A different word, same message. Okay. Intentional, intentional, intentional. You're intentionally saying, okay, I'm looking at my market. I'm seeing what's coming. Here's what I'm going to do. Let me tell you a story. A uh, year and a half, two years ago, I had a buyer who reached out to me from some of our marketing. They were outside of our market area here. And they said, hey, I'd like to buy a house. This was in the middle of the home buying frenzy, right? They're a first time home buyer. They have 5% down. They were capped at 420,000. That was it. That was where they wanted to be, right? So they call me. They're qualified. They're good to go. I called four agents. I was handing it to them. Right? No, no now, now, how many of you would love to have a $420,000 proof buyer ready to go tomorrow, right? All of us. Wouldn't that be great right now? Well, how do you get that person today? What do you need to do two years ago? You got to connect with that person two years ago when you don't need them, right? When you want to work with sellers, whether it's a seller's market or buyer's market, garbage. It's a market, right? Connect with those people regardless of this. This doesn't matter other than how you're going to communicate with your clients, how you're going to advise, how you're going to be a source of information. This shouldn't change the way you're making your market. <laughs> Big difference between urgency and desperation in sales also, isn't there? Does sales require urgency? Wouldn't it be nice if we could help our clients see the need for urgency right now to get under contract before February 14th? That's urgency. Desperation is, oh man, you gotta, you gotta get going, you gotta buy a house. Give me out the other 44 ounces. Um, <laughs> Urgent, not desperate. What if you inside feel quite desperate? It's going to come out. There's our mindset, right? There's our, there's our law of attraction. You've got to work through that, work through your crap, and then take it to your clients, right? Because you can't mask some things. Okay, so here's my graph right here. You see this right here? I was introduced to this uh, quite a few years ago by a person that I really, uh, really trust a lot. And they talk about this just as applicable life and applies to what we're doing. So the red is the roller coaster, right? The red is the market. The red is the up and the down. The red is the buyer. I'm going to wait. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to write a contract. I'm going to look at a condo. I'm going to look at a house. And they're all over. Who has that client? Right? Everybody. Up and down, up and down. I talked to them and suddenly they disappeared. Where did they go? So you've got two choices with that client, with that market, with that mm -hmm. process. You can get right behind and try and chase them down. Or you can be this blue line. Right? You're consistent. You've got a message. You're connecting. You're, you're doing slow. your flow. You have a process. You're doing the same thing over and over. Because if you're doing the same thing and you're in the same place, two things. Do they know where to find you? Do they know what to expect? Absolutely. And what's more, you're going to intersect their path a lot more than if you're chasing them. 
I just sense new idea. Did you just earn two dollars? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm trying, man. Yeah. <laughs> there was no problem with it, right? I, did I read that right? It was an aha. Uh -huh. That's a new idea. It's a new idea. Pass that down. That's it. You intersect more often. You have a consistent message of here's the market. Here's what I do. Here's how I do it. Here's where I'm at. Here's what to expect when you work with me. You're just, you're just going right through making your market. And then as that client comes up and down and up and down, you intersect all those points. And then what do they do? And they're ready. They're ready. This is what I love about social media. What a great place to connect and create consistent message over and over and over again. Okay. I don't have to go too far. Time. All right. Continuing through. We've got a few more ideas I'll let you get through. Let's talk about how to put this into practice. So number one, the question I want you to ask yourself is what is your strategy? I brought a couple of books to show you. If you have not read this book, I would highly recommend it. It's called Building a Story Brand. Great book. How many of you own an Apple phone? How many of you own Apple devices? How many of you will own Apple devices, period? I do. How many of you like Disneyland? How many of you buy crap from Disneyland? And you have Disney stuff in your house. It doesn't really matter that it was the cheapest product, right? It was the brand. You bought into the story of the brand. The brand makes you feel cool. That's what this book is. Building a story. And, and whether you know it or not, read the book and you're going to find out that's what they did. That's the secret sauce. Maybe that's why you don't because you, and you know what? It's why you don't buy Apple because you don't buy into the brand. That's it. So you need people to buy into your brand. If you don't have a brand, read this book. Great book. Read the book. Building a story brand. What's your strategy? What specific ways will you connect? And what tools will you need or use? I'm not talking about methods. I'm talking about tools. Give me an example of some tools that you might use. Say again. Video on what platform? YouTube. YouTube videos, long form videos on YouTube. What's your idea? Reels, short term, short term video. You do your long form video on YouTube and then you cut it up and you put it in your reels, right? What else? What else? What's another tool that you're going to use? Email. There's an email. What else? Cell phone. Text. Bomb bomb. Parties. Parties. Client, um, client events. What else? Your CRM. There's a tool. Other people's parties, right? I love that one. I love other people's stuff, right? Other people's time, other people's money, other people's contacts. Love it. OPM. I'm connected with Shana. Now I get to connect with all of you because she was kind of introduced me, right? Other people's stuff is great, right? If you can help them, help you. Um, what are your tools? And here's the key thing I would recommend to you from 26 years of doing this. Do not get distracted by shiny things. Yes. I'm going to tell you, and I'm in this group. I don't think there's a more ADHD group on the planet than the real estate industry, right? We gotta be a little crazy to be doing this because you're in sales, you're out there and you're doing stuff and you're talking to people and you're communicating. You gotta be a little bit nuts in my opinion because you gotta believe that you can do it number one and then you gotta actually go do it again and again. So maybe we might be akin to getting distracted by shiny things. I just saw this new idea on Instagram, this new marketing thing, this new tool, this new thing, this new class, this new, this new, this new. Oh, I've got this new idea. I've got this new thing. Is that bad? That could be great. That new idea could be the thing that propels you to success, but it's not the idea for right now. Does that make sense? What are your tools you're going to use right now? Let's say again. Your strategy. Your thing, what's your strategy? What are the tools? What's your strategy going to be to create your brand? Number two. Make a process. A process is a vital tool. A written process in my mind is a vital tool. What's your execution plan? Here's a book I like about this. Anybody read this book? Yes. Atomic Habits, great book. If you haven't read it, pick it up. What's your execution plan? How and when? What's your daily, what's your weekly, what's your monthly action plan? Written down, not just I think I'm going to do this. This is what I think I'm going to do. This is, this is what I do, right? How many of you kind of know what you do? How many of you have it written down? On Mondays, I do X. On Tuesdays, I do X. Every third week of every third Wednesday in the month, I do X. Does anybody have that written down? So I said, awesome. How does that work for you? Give me an example. What's been a benefit? Well, the product could be XP. I do help you. And I was always working on that. 
Yeah, it was a matter of having a call. So that, that wasn't my challenger to do this. So I always worked off my challenger. People asked me to do something. I said, well, send me an invite. I didn't get an invite, so now I wasn't, I wasn't sharing with me. But I just stayed constant with keeping a schedule. I knew exactly when am I going to be at my desk in the morning? When am I going to cut it off at night so that I can have family time? What, what am I uh, on boundaries? So the the elusive work life balance. There it is. And putting that into account in your daily, weekly, and monthly, and you got your yearly. Mm -hmm. And then for things that don't fit in the calendar, you usually go up on the vision board. Because when you see them when you're brushing your teeth in the morning, you're brushing your teeth at night, and you're imagining that you already have it there for you. I love everything you said. The universe provide because it put everything in place to make that happen. I'm going to give myself a dollar, two dollar bill. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put some stuff on my uh, on my mirror. Thank you for the good idea. I like that idea. That's a great Take idea. Car in the rearview mirror. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I might give myself four dollars. <laughs> Okay, I love that. I love that idea. Yes, please. Great. Let's pass it back. You're going to pass everybody two dollars but yourself, man. Let's say again. Go ahead. Love it. Love it. Yes. Yes. Creative, energetic, enthusiastic, ready to move forward, taking on new challenges. That's all crazy. You better be a little crazier. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. And then you've got this plan. What do you need to do before you start doing this? Is there someone, do you know someone smarter than you? Yes. Do you know someone with more experience than you? Yes. Do you know someone who's better at what you do than you? I do. Wouldn't it be great to go to that person and say, hey, mentor, here's my plan. What do you think? You've got great mentors in this office. Here's my plan. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Yeah. Because now, now if you go to your mentor and say, hey, I, I got this idea. Let me explain. Let me take an hour and a half of your time and explain to you what I'm going to do. Does your mentor who's wildly successful have an hour and a half to listen to you yammer on? No. Probably not. But if you say, here is my written plan. Here's what I'm going to do. Could you take 15 minutes, read this over, and let's put on your calendar and schedule an appointment to just maybe talk through this and give me your input and your advice and your ideas. Awesome, right? I sent a video over to James and Cheney the other day. I'm like, hey, I'm thinking of sending this out to realtors. What do you think? Dumb, good, bad? And I got some great feedback. So now I can adjust and adapt that. Use the people's knowledge that want to help you, which is everybody in this room, right? And emphasize the value of that. Ask a mentor. Super valuable. And by the way, do you have to ask permission for your mentor to be a mentor? Yeah. No, for heaven's sake, no. <laughs> You just go find the most successful person you know, and you call them up and you say, you are so wildly successful, and I love everything you do. Would you be willing to give me 15 minutes of time to just review my thought process because I want to be like you? Maybe. Just do it. Okay, yes, I did that. Now you're going to ask me, hey, will you be my mentor? Will you, does that make, that's what I'm saying. That's the difference. Gotcha. You just do it. And what if they say no? They were done anyway, right? They weren't that great. <laughs> We can find somebody who's willing to give back, right? Somebody who knows the value of giving back. That's the first one. Okay. Um, I, I skipped forward a slide, I think. Okay, last thing. Take action. Why did I forgot this book? Chalkwood Carry Water. Anybody read that book? Very brief read. It's easy, simple. Um, I, I, I gave it to my 17-year-old who read the whole thing. That's why no. It's digestible because he's not a big reader. He loves stuff. Reading is not one of them. But he loved this. Chalkwood Carry Water. Don't let your plan stay on paper. Tiny habits by getting Phil Fogg. That's another good one. Tiny habits. Don't let your plan stay on paper. How many of you have had a really great plan in the past that stayed on paper? Right? It happens. Don't let your plan stay on paper. And then lastly, build in a time for review. And this, is it Lane? Is that your name? Mark. I just make up a name for you. Hey, Lane, how you doing? <laughs> Perfect. You just had that sweater laid by. It was a compliment. Um, I do like a cable sweater, by the way. I'm a big fan. Um, Building Time for Review. Great book. I was actually introduced by another agent who's very successful called Traction. And the tenet that I got out of this book, Shannon knows, the tenet I got out of this book is don't chase shiny things. When you have that great idea and you go, man, this is a genius marketing thing. Perfect. That's for next quarter. Put it on your vision board. Put it on your plan for next quarter. Because you already have your plan and you're going to execute on your plan. 
And you might adjust, adjust or adapt, but you're not going to go invest $1,500 in some new system right now. You're going to execute on your plan. And then when you're planning for your next 30 days, you say, hey, this idea that I came across was good. Is this still good? Where do we fit this into our plan in the future? So that you're not constantly traction, right? You're building traction with your plan. You're not constantly spinning your wheels, trying the bright new shiny thing. Well, this didn't work. What about that? How long do you think it takes for a marketing plan to have effect? What, do you, what would you guess? Three to six months. Three to six months, I think, is a valid number. So if you've done something for 60 days and you saw no results, are you done? No. Well, hopefully, if you did your plan, you talked to your mentor, that smart person, and they said, yeah, this seems like a good idea, you probably started out with a foundationally solid plan. And then you can just adjust or adapt a little bit. Because if you're just throwing money in a pit, stop doing that. But you didn't throw money in a pit because you started out with a valid plan. Does this make sense where I'm going with this? Okay, take action. Execute, execute, execute. Do not let your plans on paper. Your plan on paper is of no value to you. Your plan in your action, hugely valuable to you, hugely valuable to your clients, right? This is how you're going to add tons of value. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes. Can we have a couple more minutes? We got a couple more minutes. Oh, man, I, I, I went to the video. Commitment changes everything. Anybody heard this quote before? A German philosopher, von Goethe, I think. I don't speak German. I speak French. I always call him Goff. But somebody told me, oh, it's Goethe. Um, that sounds fancy. So, okay. I'm going to read this. Until one is committed, there is always hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always an effectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elemental truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid pants, plans that the moment one definitely commits to oneself, providence moves to. You've heard this quote. All sorts of things, I've got this post, all sorts of things occur to help one that would otherwise never have occurred. A whole stream of events Issues from the decision raising to one's favor, all manner of unforeseen instances and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can, again, boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Do it. Execute. Um, when I was 17, I worked for this guy, and he had this hanging on the wall, wildly successful dude. And when I left to go do some other things in my life, he's like, here, take this. You need to have this with you. And he went and hung another one up on his wall. Um, this is a truism in my experience. In my 26 years of doing this, this is true. When I can look back over my history and say, I failed here. I didn't meet my goals here. This was not a really great time in my career. I can tie that to this. Does that sound right? I can tie that to not being committed to what I was doing. Get distracted by the shiny thing. Commitment. Execute, commit, commit. This changes everything. Here's my fun video. Anybody know this guy? He's an interesting dude. Sorry, I want to share the audio. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Commitment. When you would get it in the hands of somebody who is. Yeah. Just so we can hear it on Zoom. Okay, here we go, Zoomers. A golf club is just a golf club. You can pay $500 or $5,000 for it. It's just a golf club until you put it into the hands of Tiger Woods. When you put it into the hands of Tiger Woods, the value shoots up. It's the same set of clubs. All you added was commitment. When you get it in the hands of somebody who is committed to a dream, who's been working when they was five, and swinging when they were six, and swinging when they were nine, and swinging when they were 12, oh yes, you're gonna get a great return because there is a great investment. Do you have anything that you are dreaming, that you're willing to be committed to enough to see it happen? Awesome, right? Tiger Woods, hit me was five, hit me was seven. Consistency. Are you committed enough to be consistent? Commitment changes everything. A couple quotes I like. Tony Robbins, when you're committed to change, life starts to look different. You stop fearing what might happen instead, embrace it. You stop wondering, how can I change? And instead, his whole catchphrase, take massive action. Um, these three people, they wrote a book. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. If you Google them, you'll find it. And this I love. Commitment is a statement of what is. You can know what you're committed to by your results, not by what you say you're committed to. Does that sound true? The results are it. We are all committed. We're all producing results. The result is a proof of a commitment. We're all committed to something because we're all producing results of something. So if you want to know what you're committed to, what do you have to look at? Look at your results. Look at the law of the harvest. What are you harvesting? That's what you're committed to. 
And if what you're harvesting isn't what you want, what do you got to do? Commit to change, right? Commit to change. Commit to change. Anybody know who Jim Rohn is? So Jim Rohn taught this guy. So Jim Rohn was Tony Robbins' mentor. Motivation is what gets you started. Commitment is what keeps you going. And there's a thousand more of these, right? So commitment. You got to commit. Execute, commit, take action. There you go. So in recap, learn from history. The cycle repeats. Be prepared for the cycle. Make your market. Be the constant. Don't ride the roller coaster. Strategy and execute. And then lastly, commitment changes everything. Traction is vital. And the next two years, that is what is going to propel you on to being mega agent, right? Get traction. Start today. And how many of you wish you had done this two years ago? How many wish that you started on social media two and a half years ago? Um, her name just escaped me. She's a she's kind of a guru now in South Carolina. She's an agent. If you're on social media, you've seen her. She's a speaker. She's all over the place. Um, Barbara something or other. She's out of the South. Anyway, she's got a massive following. She posted her first video on TikTok two years ago. And then she was consistent. And she did it and she did it and she did it. So are, if you haven't started on some of this stuff, are you inexorably behind? No, because in six months, you got six months behind you. So commit, the present is perfect. Commit to changing the future. Forget about what you didn't do. Take that growth from that. Commit to going forward. Execute on your plan. The moment one definitely commits, Providence moves to. That's it. That's what I got. The help? I still have money. Why do I have money? Awesome. I'll take the power. <laughs> Guys, what would you say is the biggest source of all frustration? Expectations. Expectations. It's when things aren't the way we think they should be or the way we expect them to be. He touched on this. Are we setting the proper expectations for the process for our clients, right? What are they expecting? In my opinion, there's not good markets and bad markets. There's just the market. He talked about adjusting our strategy depending on what the market is, but we should be conveying that message to our clients. It's like, yeah, it is kind of bad right now. It just is what it is right now, and it'll be this way again, and it'll change. And so what are we going to do today about the market? So there's a lot we can unpack and stick around and, and, and visit about and mastermind about. But I want to introduce our sponsor. We've got a sponsor in the office for lunch first. Hi, and here he comes. This is Yancey with the Equity Home Warranty. Thanks for bringing lunch and tell us about what you do. I'm Yancey. This is Dalton. And we are Equity Home Warranty. Let me grab one. Okay. You are around. Right. Does everybody get one of these? Yeah. I'll let Joel start. Did everyone get a ticket? I'm just here to get a Christmas present. You want to hear the fun stuff? I'm doing the fun stuff. All right, well, for those of you who don't know us, we're equity and warranty. Been doing this for about 20 years now. I worked with Shannon for a long time. I recognize some of your faces that are in here. And we have great plans to offer you guys. Not all home warranty companies are the same. We're not the biggest in Utah. We like to say we're the best. We've been doing it for a long time. We're more of a boutique style. So if you're looking for personalized customer service, that's what we're here to offer you. How many of you right now have listings? Okay, guess what we have? We have listing coverage. Put this on your, how much is listing coverage, Joel? It's free. Doesn't cost anything. Nope. Yeah. It's free. free. Yeah. Now it's our orange plan. So if you look at it, we're still the only company I think out there, one of them that still has a $300 plan. Is that crazy? 300 bucks and you can cover your furnace, air conditioner, water heater, most of your kitchen appliances for still 300 bucks. That's a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. It doesn't cover everything, you guys. And I won't say that it does, but we do cover a lot. We also are the home of the two-year plan, so you can take any of these plans, multiply it by two, and you've got two years. How much are most home warranty companies, home warranty right now? All right, so if we took and just needed a house with two years of coverage and had that, can we get two years of home warranty for 600 under the base we have? And that's still pretty good coverage, okay? It's like I say, not everything. So we offer, you can break them down. Not all homes are the same. So you can look and see the options. We have guest house coverage. We have swimming pool coverage. What else do we have, Joel? Well, duplex, yeah, triplex, duplex, new construction, apartments. Um, we've got a bunch of, we've got, we've got about everything out there that you can cover. If it's a home, we can put a home warranty on it. Um, and we're also going straight to consumers right now. So any house that you guys already have on the market doesn't have to be in a real estate transaction. If you're trying to open up a conversation with some of your clients that you have out there right now, for a hundred dollars more than what we have priced here, and if with your referral, we'll allow them to go direct to consumer and anybody can put a home warranty on the house. Okay? Kind of good that way. 
What else? You guys will see that 500 is our most expensive plan. We didn't raise our rates like the rest of our competitors did. Yeah. So if $600 is being written in with our company, the buyer gets that $100 and they can use it to re their house or, get, or, or take advantage of the services we offer. Yeah. So that's a huge benefit to your clients to get our best plan and get $100 to use to however they want, how they see fit. If they need to place a claim with us, they can use that money to cover the service call fee. Service call fee is only 60 bucks. When prices went up to 600, I believe most of the service call fees went up to 75 bucks. We're still at 60 for you guys as clients. So we're keeping it low for you guys and them. We're going to keep it that way through 2023. So see where we go from that. We anticipate things are going to turn around. Okay. And you get an A plus service. We're A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau while still offering our best plan for $100 less than the rest of the competition. Okay. It's Christmas, so we thought we'd give some stuff away. Who likes to take it? Is everybody going to take it? Yeah. All right. So, what are we supposed to start with first? You know, I'll let you. Okay, okay. let's give away a t shirt. Size medium. Because these are good t shirts. These are your normal cotton. We have a copy, huh? Yeah. See, it's got a copy. Oh, all right. Go ahead. What is it? Uh, no, no. Read the number. You're reading the number. Oh, I mean, no, this stuff, stuff is my ticket. So, oh, well, you, I, I, I was dropping in a risk. I probably did drop it. it. You drew a different Did I draw a different one? Where I, I, wow, I am really confusing this process. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 603 9061. 9061? I'm telling you, it was your. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah. my number. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. There we go. All right. 6039065. 65. Sorry. Thank you. We're having you draw so that we're not responsible for the action. We thought that was cute. So, how did it work out? That was awesome. So, let's try this time. 9057. Hey, Nat. Okay, can you pass it back to her? All right. Okay, you're going to win something, I promise. 9069. Skinny hand mud. 0609. <laughs> We got, we got another uh, hat. Six two. Six two. Six two. Six two. Okay, let's see. We got another hat. We got uh, nine zero six one. That's me. Hey, hey. Nine zero six eight. Six eight. Huh? Oh, okay. Black one. Black. Okay. Nine zero five two. All right. Hat in the back. Nine zero six seven. We've got a Vegas. Let's see. Nine zero seven one. Oh, we got a black one. Black one. Black seven one. Okay, pass it on back. Sorry, thanks, guys. Six three. Another black one. One more skinny fan. Uh, nine zero six zero. Six zero. Okay, right there. Pass it back. Now we're going to do umbrellas. Now the umbrellas represent you guys' look. So each one of our plans that you look in there, that's what we've got, right? This branding, you talked about branding, right? Hey, we got umbrellas, hidden away umbrellas. We got one more okay. color, just, just keep it simple. Let's go color. Okay. Everybody, you know what I'm saying? Let's keep it that way. Hey, keep drawing. Let's do a blue umbrella. All right. We got uh, seven two. Yep. Seven two. It's the best one right here. We got seven O. Seven right here. Seven O. Who said it's going to be like everybody in the 
64. Nice. You probably have one of those, huh? Yeah, they did them all. All right. Okay. Uh, 58. 58. And, and this is the this is the suspense. 51. Nice. There you go. All right, we're going lunch in the back. We're going to sit down, but if you guys need to go home orange company, give us a mind. Merry Christmas. We're, we're committed. Commitment. He spoke about commitment. He's been in it 30 years. I've been in it 25. We've been around a long time. We know how to work with you guys. Yeah, go ahead. You have... How fast do you guys get your legs off or get your legs off? 24 to 48 hours. Now, if you call in right now, if we don't have them out, and about, then they'll head there right now. We've got 65 contractors on our network. They come first. Our contractors prioritize. Even if you don't have a warranty and you need help, call us our contractors. You don't want to like sit down and go face to face, skin to skin, bone to bone. We want to make sure that we know who's going out into your homes, right? That's one of our things that we prioritize. It's just not some randoms that we have out there. So I don't think we had anybody go longer than 48 hours during this HVAC season this last year, where a lot of other companies had a lot of, they waited a long time. Like you said earlier, we're, we, we keep, we, uh, we keep our operation a little smaller and it allows us to, to, you know, turn those a lot quicker than a lot of the bigger companies. So, yeah. not trying to so can we get the email to send if we want to get the list of customers? Yeah, you, yeah, honestly, you can, you can email either one of us or you can just go straight to our website cards are there yeah and what's cool if you go on equitystack.com all you this is how easy it is honestly you put sellers coverage you go to our website you click on seller it's going to bring you up a page you put in your name the seller's info hit submit your coverage is started that's how easy it is you know i mean it's so much easier than to even fill out an email to do it online and if you save the link or do it from your phone your phone converts it to an app and you can save that to your home screen. If you have an Apple device, I can show you how to do that. And it treats it just like an app to where you can go on at any time. Super simple question. I'm not listening to everything. Uh -huh. Some companies do. If you need to actually use it, uh -huh. then do you have to purchase something? No. Here's what we ask. Joel and I have made a commitment that we've never billed anybody for seller's coverage. If they do use it, tell them, look, the cheapest plan is 300. Let's at least get that for the buyer, especially if we've saved them. They break it down for you on HVAC. There are limits on seller's coverage. So HVAC, you get up to 500 bucks towards repairs. But we didn't put a limit on water heaters. So water heaters are how much right now, you guys? Well, so, so let's say, let's say, let's say that this water heater went out. Let's say they, Jeff, you guys call us. You said, my water heater went out on this list. We'll send somebody out there. We're going to replace their water heater. And we're going to pay for the labor to do that. But if there's any code upgrades that need to happen, that's all on the homeowner. So the homeowner is still going to be out five, 600 bucks, but we will pay for that water heater, okay? And all the other thing we ask is it's not there that when you guys get your inspection reports back, that's something you hand us and say, this is what we need Yeah, if you take advantage of the listing coverage, just put in the remarks, uh, seller, or, or there's already a home warranty in place. One of the nice things about us having the seller and the buyer is there's no lapse in coverage. So that seller's warranty is good up until they close. And then once they close and it funds, the buyer's warranty kicks in and there's really no lapse in coverage. So the people that have seller's warranties with us, we're not telling them, well, that was a pre-existing condition. We're not going to cover it because the seller's warranty would have handled it. So. Has anyone ever had anything happen on the listing where they have used the warranty? I have. I just want to know if you have any that home warranty then require you to buy the home warranty? That's what I've heard. Some of them are required inspection. Or, yeah. yeah. Some of them are required to be paid for. Ours now, don't be alarmed when you order it and you're going to see it's the $300 plan. It's going to say right at the top, this is not an invoice. This is just an order confirmation. True story, and I'll just let you guys know because the chicken's getting cold. We brought Chick fil A. Everybody like Chick fil A? Yeah. yeah. So I'll let you go do that. We have property managers, not to hammer anybody in here because I got a property manager. I have investment property myself. They used it put it on all the property management properties without them being listed. Mm -hmm. And then when I came six months later, I'm like, hey, these aren't listed. And they're like, well, they're in my pocket. I can sell them if I want. And I'm like, okay. Yeah. So we've had to protect ourselves saying that if we see any fraud or something like that happening, we could bill $300, but we haven't yet not made. So 
We do have that in there for our protection just in case, but we've never enforced it, okay? So don't let that throw you off and say, oh, yeah, it's he's lying to you. I'm not lying to you. Um, what's your name? Thanks, Yeah, appreciate you. Thanks for having us, guys. Oh, you're like Santa Claus. You know? <laughs> 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 